this time we have been joined by our mayor, Honorable Andre Dickens, and would like to uh, speak to the committee. Mayor Dickens, welcome. Good, good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, members of the city council and uh, the one or two people that applauded. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for this opportunity to speak directly to the city council and uh, directly to the public safety committee. Uh, I am here because I take public safety very seriously. And rather than do a press conference to talk about public safety and to talk about all things, I decided to talk to my colleagues, talk directly to you, and also talk directly with the public in this process. Um, as you know, for years I sat beside you all right here in this seat, so I understand the challenges and dilemmas and the options that you weigh each and every day as you go about doing the great work of a city council person of this city. And I wanted to just share with you a lot of what's all happening. And then later, of course, during your committee meeting, uh, Deputy Chief Peak will give you your, uh, your briefing that he does every two weeks along with Chief um, Interim Chief Sherbaum. So thus far, we have hired uh, over 100 police officers this year, and 155 of the, those uh, 155 individuals are in training right now towards our 250 goal. The homicide clearance rate in the city of Atlanta is 64 percent. The national average is 54 percent. And this weekend, we had a number of incidents that we want to talk directly about. Um, all summer, we've had a good summer, a good summer at our parks. Uh, it was a safe place to be. We opened all 12 swimming pools and made them free for the whole summer. We've had events after events after events. We've had midnight basketball. We've had police athletic league at Promise. We had a lot going on in our parks. But this week, as Council Member Boone knows, I mean, last week on Tuesday, a murder happened in Wilson Mill Park, the park that we shared as a kids growing up. And then yesterday at Dunbar, we had essentially a mass shooting where six individuals were shot. Uh, two are now deceased, and that happened at a city park uh, on a Sunday. That is alarming and disturbing. Uh, we have hosted several large-scale events in our city parks without incident, um, and we know a lot of our parks are being used daily for a number of great activities, day and night, um, and we have world-class parks, and we even have a new uh, commissioner of Parks and Recreation that has taken us to even higher heights. We've installed cameras in the parks and we've tied, uh, tied those cameras to our real-time crime fighting center so that we get on-time uh, on updates. We also are allocating today. You all will see and comment and vote on legislation to allocate $750,000 um, for post-certified officers to work in our city parks. So this is on top of our summer safety plan where we had officers in our parks. We are now adding that to, th that was just an implementation by the administration, but this is now putting $750,000 towards post-certified individuals to work in our parks to further keep our parks safe because we want those to be safe havens and active places for community. So just go through the data, the numbers. In 2021, we had 57 part one crimes by this time. Now we've had 49 at parks, and that's a 14% reduction year to date in crimes at parks. And I wanted to now go down the path of talking about youth, which is very near and dear to my heart and a very important part of all of our activity sets for moving Atlanta forward and also for public safety. The city's results from the summer youth engagement, the employment program, you will get those results as the summer is just now ending, but it's been a huge success, and from programs like Midnight Basketball. But since I'm talking specifically to the Public Safety Committee, I wanted to just tell you what youth activities have not occurred in our city due to us making sure that we had them on a positive path. In 2021, last year, there were 102 youth juvenile arrests. This year, only 80. 
That's a reduction of 22% in youth-related crime in our city this year to date. In 2021, just in June and July, and those are the months when youth are generally out of school. So in June and July last year, 34. This year, 23. That's a 32% reduction. We tie those things to the activities that we've done and with the community. The various things that we've done, like at Promise Center, midnight basketball, summer employment for the youth, and our water sales that we've, that we've tried to reduce as much as possible and push them into meaningful, helpful activities, that has resulted in this reduction in arrests and crime by youth. APD has seen a significant reduction in the calls for service regarding water sales in both the year to date and in the summer months. The reduction for this year uh, held through 8 1, uh, held, held through August 1st, there were 929 last year, 929 calls talking about water sales. We call them water boys, but a lot of them are adults or, or boys, men. 929 last year, 651 this year. That's a 35% reduction. In 2021, in just June and July, we had 327 calls for service. This year, 229. That's a 32.3% reduction. And that's just in June and July. So what we are putting in place, ladies and gentlemen, is working. It's working. We said that we had to have a balanced approach to crime, a balanced appro approach to public safety. We wanted to make sure that we had people give them opportunities. And that's what we did with the youth in this city. And when we do it for this city, pretty much we're doing it for the whole region. Because the individuals that come into our city to sell water or to do whatever, they may not be an APS student, uh, Chief Appling. They are coming because the opportunity is in Atlanta. But what we've done together is reduce crime and arrest for those youth because of putting them on the right path. We are arresting individuals that won't comply. And we are sending the youth to, to services that they need to be able to get into the proper position. And we're talking to parents about all of the activities that we have for their youth to be on the right path. Today, I want to now talk squarely and straightforward about ACDC, the Atlanta Detention Center. Over the course of the last week, several members of the city council, many of you took a tour of ACDC. And some of you have taken tours in years past, and, so, and then also you took tours of the Fulton County Jail this last week, and even some today. It is evident that there is a humanitarian need when you walk through that facility. We're not in the jailing business. That is not what Mayor Dickens wants to be in. I do not want to be in the jailing business. The city of Atlanta has the aforementioned things that we are focused on. However, when confronted with hundreds of men sleeping on the floor throughout the hallways, the humanitarian response to that is to do something. Do something immediately. We are not in the jailing business. I do not want to be in the jailing business for long. That is my personal constitution, and that is what I'm bringing to this administration. But nonetheless, we find, we find ourselves where we are today. There are severe penalties for any extension beyond the four-year extension that you see in the documentation that we provided today. We've baked into this ordinance into this offer, four years and no more. Extreme penalties if, if anyone needs to stay any longer than that, if they want anyone to stay any longer than that. We will be out of the jail and business immediately. Revenue from that agreement will be used to fund our diversion and wraparound services, drug addiction, mental health, housing insecurity, homelessness, and of course, youth services and the general um, administration of the facility. There is no question, again, that I draw circles and I don't draw lines. I am trying to help us serve our population, all of our population in this region. Within this ACDC circle, there is a line that must be drawn, though. And that line is where the responsibility is for overcrowding. And that overcrowding is a county issue. It's a county issue. It's Fulton County's issue. 
The vision for repurposing ACDC has been set. I have heard from all 15 of our council members and the council president, and the agreement is reflective of what we all want to see. So the reason for 700 beds is that this is a humanitarian need. I came into this conversation with much less than 700 beds. Through conversations with you all, I got to 700 beds. This is because that's the need. I want it to be much less than that. But of course, the need has pushed us to where we find ourselves with a situation where there's women, 250, actually 300 women, more than 250 that that facility should have, 300 women on the south side, and now hundreds of individuals on the floor at Rice Street. More than 80% of the individuals at Fulton County's Rice Street facility are from Atlanta. The crimes occurred in the city of Atlanta. 80% of the individuals that are at Rice Street, the incident happened inside of our city limits. So regardless of what they may or may not have done, uh, they, are still hum they are still human beings and this requires a humanitarian response. And our moral obligation is for everyone's health and well-being regardless of the choices they may or may not have made. So now, once this is in place, should the council pass it, then we begin the process of having individuals come into ACDC at the same time we start the process of putting out an RFI, a request for your inquiries, request for individuals to companies to say, put their plans together for what the future of ACDC can be. Imagining from the documents that we've already put together in the past, start putting together the process for the financing of it, the architecture of it, the construction of it, and the operation of it. That is not a tomorrow turnkey operation. That takes time. That takes planning. That takes just as much planning as it would for us to build a new city hall, to build a new park. It doesn't happen in a week. It takes time. So therefore, this RFI gives us the opportunity to gain more community input, gain more city council input, and to go out there and, pre and present in four years, once we cut off this process of having uh, inmates at ACDC, then we turn ourselves into what the next future is, which is not with us in the jailing business. Now, I know there's, after that, there's an uh, additional piece of legislation as uh, Councilmember Waits walks in. This is about her legislation. So it is my understanding that there are some additional legislation that's being introduced uh, by our great council member uh, that serves in the seat that I served in, council member Waits. And what I say is we've had a great conversation about it and I am interested and encouraged by what she suggested. However, we have to wait, have this process take place first for that process to take place. Because if we're looking for the RFI, we wanna make sure that we get the full everything that we can, having her input in it, your input in it, all of the things that we want for the go forward plan for ACDC takes that into consideration. And so I think her legislation is a smart piece of legislation. I think that this comes first, then that. Therefore, you have the steps in the right order that we carry ourselves forward. Now, moving on. There are too many illegal guns on our streets. You know there are too many illegal guns when some individuals, well, everybody's talking about how many illegal guns there are. An overwhelming majority of homicides in Atlanta are linked to gangs, drugs, and the use of illegal, illegally held firearms. The vast majority of the perpetrators are repeat offenders. And so that's why we stood up the repeat offender tracking unit. So let's talk about crime in general in the city of Atlanta. Because when you read the news, when you watch the news, read the news, and get your social media, you would think that everything is on fire. That we are down in every category over the last 28 day period. We have had a three week decline in crime. The One Safe City Plan is a whole of government approach to public safety in Atlanta. And we just launched a new website onesafecity.com. So everyone listening can stay up to date on what we're doing to keep Atlanta safe, and the results of our efforts are on that website so far, onesafecity.com. 
So my message to the residents of Atlanta and the visitors is clear. Our city is open for business and enjoyment. You and your families are safe in Atlanta, and we are working across our government and our communities to invest in our policing and non-policing initiatives to protect and promote the quality of life in our city. I also have a clear message for those who want to perpetrate a crime in our city. If you pull a gun in this town, you are going to jail. We got a 64% clearance rate, and I'm really, really hopeful. And it's better than the national average, but it's my hope it gets even higher. You pull a gun in this town, you go to jail. If you're a gang leader, you will be caught and you will be held accountable. And finally, if you're carrying an, an illegal firearm, you will face the consequences. So far this year, we've We've seized thousands of illegal firearms already this year. And that continues. We find them over and over and over again. And those are the same guns that are used in robberies, burglaries, shootings, aggravated assaults, and also homicides. So we know who our adversary is. It's gangs, it's guns, it's illegal firearms, and it's repeat offenders violent repeat offenders. When argument happens, people are choosing guns instead of their words to solve these problems. Anger and a gun is a bad combination right now all across America. Anger and a gun has led to people killing their loved ones, their family members, their friends. We even had a senior high rise, a senior citizen killed the leasing office agent, then went across the street and killed himself. Anger. So we have a lot of resources in this city right now. Our Office of Violence Reduction is at our disposal, Ms. Jacquel Clemens. We have clergy that is willing to talk to every community member, every nonprofit organization, how we can engage on de-escalation, on conflict resolution. Because most of the crimes that we're seeing that are leading to homicides, a lot of them are the inability for people to resolve their conflicts. But when we talk about these other property crimes, we are talking about violent repeat offenders. So modern, effective policing, repeat offender tracking unit, the summer safety plan, the summer heat wave, which you guys get reports on that we are, I mean, a whole lot of guns and a lot of drugs are being um, are being captured because of that. We got mounted patrols, fuses, the Connect Atlanta camera network, public safety training center, community-based policing, supporting police personnel, hiring 250 officers, providing raises and bonuses to retain our, all of our public safety uh, staff, and good police leadership. Those are the things that we've been using to reduce crime in our city. The non-police interventions. We've had violence reduction initiatives, diversion programs, the nightlife division that we've stood up, and our nightlife advisory council. Midnight basketball, the light up the night campaign. We're now at almost our halfway mark on all of the 10,000 cameras, that, I mean, lights that we're installing. The at promise centers, housing interventions, like what we're doing at uh, placing people from Forest Cove into safe and secure housing, summer youth employment program, our re-entry job programs. And just last week, I visited the ATF, the Atlanta Field Office for uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and I met with their special agent in charge. We also started Atlanta Fulton County Court Watch. We've been aggressive against gangs, and we have good state and federal partnerships. Together, the community is empowered to help us. That's where the violence reduction comes from, the engagement with the nightlife and our Atlanta court watch. We've had the world's largest 10K Peachtree Road race go down without incident. Three days of Jazz Fest, 70,000 people in our city park, no issue. Our West Side Park, our Cook Park, these parks, all these activities are going on without issue restaurants and people are going places each and every day being safe. We are on our way 
to making sure we prove to everyone that we are a safe city. One to one and a half million people go to Lenox and Phipps Plaza every single month, and we haven't had one violent incident in 2022 at those places. Over and over again, where large gatherings are, we are safe. So what we saw yesterday was a lot of things that I wish we did not have in this city. But I also want to make sure when they put a microphone in your face and try to scare you into believing that this is an unsafe city, the fortitude of a council member and the administration knows the difference. Now, the last couple of things I'll talk about is nuisance properties. Nuisance properties must be resolved. And those are not just bars and nightclubs. It could be any person at any place that this place feels unsafe. In fact, we're also seeing results from our nightlife, uh, our nightlife division and our nightlife advisory council. We have held two quarterly meetings, our training days already, and we've had other meetings with the nightlife team, uh, about three of them over the last three weeks, to make sure we talk about nightlife and ways to improve it. Communications with our nightlife leaders have gone a very long way. Now that we have all the right departments at the table, including police, fire, the solicitor's office, planning, watershed, and others, we're able to address some of the bad actors much more quickly than we were a, a, just a half year ago. So we now know how to differentiate and how to make sure that bad actors become good actors or bad actors that want to stay bad actors are eliminated from being able to have the permission to operate in our city. It is not a right, it is a permission. That's what a permit is. And so the good actors can continue to operate. And so the solicitor's office continues to bring charges against problematic properties and either the property owners are kicking the tenants out and locking up their doors or we are locking their doors for them. We want to make sure that everyone have safe experiences at our, at our restaurants, at our bars, at our clubs, at our gas stations, convenience stores, nuisance properties. It's not just nightlife. It's any nuisance property. So I'm agnostic to whatever you guys choose. You do two incidents in 24 months, that's your decision. We can talk about it with the committee, with the team of people at the Nightlife Advisory Council. If it's four in 24 months, if it's three in 18 months, all of those are up for discussion. And the Nightlife Advisory Committee, they are going to meet on Thursday and, and have 100% attendance. And the Nightlife Advisory team, by the way, is everybody from operators like Live Nation to Blue Flame. Operators, as well as promoters, as well as lawyers, as well as individuals that are property owners, all of them are a part of the Nightlife Advisory Council. But again, this nuisance property um, legislation that, I'm, that, I, that, that I think I'm, that you guys have before you today, that uh, from what I can tell in that ordinance, you're talking about nuisance properties, not just nightlife. And so I came here in support of y'all making sure that you work together with the advisory council, the advisory team. They're going to meet on Thursday. Um, and you guys work out two and 24, three and 18. I, those are the, those, that's where government gets to make the difference in how we communicate with the public and understand what's the best. But what we do want is to make sure that operators operate the right way and that bad actors get dealt with in a way that either makes them become good actors or they act in somebody else's jurisdiction and not ours. So I'll pause there and just say thank you to my colleagues. Again, I wanted to go over public safety. Mr. Hillis, uh, Chairman Hillis, you and I both have served on public safety for many years. When I was a city council member and I had the honor and privilege to serve as the chairman um, in 2017. And I didn't want to do a press conference or anything where I'm talking to folks and you're not in the room. I wanted to make sure I talked to the city council about the things that's going on. And also, I know I have friends, neighbors, colleagues, um, and, 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 and folks that, are, and community members that are in this room, and they have concerns and input on all of it. And my team that's behind me, everybody from the COO, the chief of staff, the uh, senior advisor, to police officials, to nightlife coordinator, coordinator to the film and entertainment office, the deputy COOs, to all of the above, police, fire. We stand here with you. We stand with the citizens of Atlanta, and we plan to continue to get it right. As you've seen, those numbers go down. Um, we we, we, we want to continue in that um, path and that trajectory. Today, you have 
uh, some pieces of legislation before you. The council, uh, you have an awesome role to play. My administration has voiced our support of the ones that we want to see move forward today and the ones that um, we want more time to discuss. We've shared those with you as well. We hope you um, work with us on this. Thank you so much. Council members, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mayor Dickens. Anyone? Uh, Council Member Boone. Also, as the mayor acknowledged, we have been joined by Council Member Waits, a member of this committee, and then also uh, Council Member Antonio Lewis. Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, thank you so much for your support um, during the incident at Wilson Mill Park. And I want to publicly thank the chief um, of police um, for coming out, walking with the neighbors and talking with them. Um, within 24 hours, he was on the ground. Uh, Ms. Burks, Mr. Otta, thank you all also for your concern. And it's unfortunate that that happened. Um, in Southwest Atlanta. That's a very quiet park, and we look forward to working with you all so that that park can return to safety. Again, thank you um, for your support for that community. Thank you. Councilmember Boone. Councilmember Waits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for taking the time out of your calendar to join us. As you know, we have met uh, and discussed our concerns with respect to the jail issue, and I think that uh, we know where we both stand on that. But with respect to the nuisance law, uh, I originally was a signer on this particular piece of legislation for the same reasons that you have eloquently spoke of today. And I think the headlines in the news speak to the fact that we need to do something. The phone calls that I have received, and I'm pretty sure most of us in the room have received, are with respect to properties that are located in districts that uh, are pro-development, meaning they feel that they have been somehow harassed by individuals who are utilizing this as a tool uh, to put them out of business. So I'm not here to speak to whether or not that is true or not. But for me, that gives me pause in terms of making sure that this legislation does not have unintended consequences. So I won't be labor because I know people are waiting for public comment, but I will say this. Uh, I believe that there was a mugging in Lenox Square Mall this weekend. And my feeling is that when it comes to Lenox Square Mall, they're not going to be treated as a bad actor, meaning they are a business that is operating and things around them happen. I, I, I didn't need the, the collapse up I, because the mayor also understands both sides of the issue. but but. We, this is a complex situation, and what I believe is that, that we need to figure out how we protect those small mom and pop business owners. Uh, because my feeling is that this particular tool may be weaponized against them, and they don't have the high-powered attorneys to protect themselves. And so for that reason, sir, I am a no only for that reason. But I will say to you, for that reason, I also signed on because I agree with you that we have some very serious challenges. And your presence here means a lot to me today. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Waits, for uh, all of that, because I, I, um, you know, I value your input, and that's why we meet and share ideas often. Um, and so to go to all of that, so specifically, it's nuisance properties. It's not just nightlife. In fact, our nightlife activities, since we put in place the nightlife division, we've gone out and done a number of assessments of properties north, south, east, and west, um, gone to these establishments, help them with their safety plans, help them look at their lighting, their cameras. What are their de-escalation um, uh, procedures? What are their procedures if a mass shooting occurs? Many of them have been grateful for the assistance of police and fire and, and knowledgeable uh, subject matter experts coming in there and helping them fortify their places of business so that people can enjoy them but go home safe. And a lot of times they're thinking about the patrons, but also their staff. They're thinking about how to do, you know, how to manage all of that. And so I'm happy with the progress of the nightlife division because we've seen a significant reduction in crimes that have occurred at nightlife, notwithstanding one or two very notable incidents that have happened. But we went about 45 to 60 days without one incident happening at our nightlife establishments. I'm proud of that. That's not meaning that we're coming to penalize that. We're coming to lock arms and partner with that. So therefore, those individuals that are calling saying this is the right direction, they're showing up to the training day to get training. 
on how to work with neighborhoods because that's also part of the training is neighborhoods call and say you're too noisy, how to deal with that. Neighborhoods call and say can you use the patio, can you not? All those things, we're helping nightlife establishments in that regard. And also how to protect your property with APD or with private security. What is the right number of people for your configuration? All that is in the works to be a partner with nightlife, and that partnering has led to a reduction in crimes at nightlife establishments. I stand here saying we are on the right path. Nuisance properties are every type of property, as you mentioned. If Lenox Mall has 50 incidents or 40 incidents or two in 24 months, as you would suggest, whatever you come up with as the rule, that rule is established for every operator. And so does the appeals process and the, um, I would say, the uh, restoration process. It is not to simply th th lock you up and throw away the key, so to speak, to cancel your business. It is to make sure that if you are not in compliance with the rules, you have to set aside time to get into compliance with the rules. That could be a shutdown for X number of days that we all should discuss. That's the work of the council and, and the administration. Is it 30 days? Is it 10 days? Is it 45 days? That is the work of us to decide how long you need to sit down because people are dying in your facility or people are getting shot in your facility. That is called decency and respect for victims. Conversation throughout this public safety committee has to use the word victim every now and then. There is a such thing as a victim. And so a victim that happens twice in a month or twice in whatever number we come up with, they have rights, they need to see justice occur too. And so when we see a bad actor, whether it's Linux or not, whether it's name your favorite hotel that may have something going on and something happened, they have to come sit before a body and explain themselves and say what is their way to get back on track. That's what, that's what my understanding of your legislation is, right? So with that, it's not to hurt mom and pops and keep the non-mom and pops going. It is a process. And so if the Chevron in District 12 continues to have shootings at it, I don't care who owns it. It's time out for that Chevron. Because there's a victim on the other end, Council Member Waits, right? And there are people who are victims because they feel unsafe going to that Chevron. So you victimize whether you got shot or you victimize because you live in a food desert and you can't go to the Chevron because folks getting shot. I don't care if you're a mom, pop, or a conglomerate. The truth of the matter is in our city, it got to stop. That's how we vote. We vote on stopping things that we don't want in this city. We don't, we don't do that. Figure out which way the wind blows. We got to stop the foolishness in our city. So if it's a Chevron that's owned by 10 or if it's a Chevron owned by one, I don't care. If a grandma got shot there my first month on the job and somebody gets shot there this month, I think the council got something to say about that or should, and then we got to sit them down and talk to that operator. And they, and they stop for a few, how many days we come up with? That's my answer. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, I'm not on this committee, but I, I thought it was important to be here today uh, just as you did, so I appreciate you for coming. Thank you for coming to speak to council. I appreciate you for drawing circles. I always tell you, you draw circles. Um, but I'm a person who draw half circles, right? I haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I haven't <laughs> aged to the point where I draw full circles yet, right, around the lines. So you move in good faith, and I always tell people you're a deacon. I always say he's a deacon, so you got to remember that portion, right? But when we're moving with, uh, you have a well-developed plan to move out of the jail lease in four years. Uh, last week when I met with the sheriff, his plan was not the same. And so I want to see the sheriff move out of the jail. He won't, uh, the same way, the, the same kind of plan as he have it, to move in, he has a plan to ramp up. Like he won't just put 700 people in the jail overnight. He's going to get there over time. He won't just put all of his sheriffs in that jail overnight. He's going to get there over time. I want to see uh, if it's a one-year plan to move to 700 beds, I want to see a one-year plan to move out. Uh, I want to see that same intention 
uh, up front. And so that's why I would like more time on that jail. Uh, because once again, I know you move in good faith and I always make sure I say you're a deacon. <laughs> but I know I want to see the same type of intention to move into the jail to get to 700. I want to see him move down to zero the same exact way. I want to see that same plan on day, you know, before yeah. I give a vote. I like you, you would, uh, engineer deacon, uh, <laughs> mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lewis, you are uh, astute and, um, uh, you know, a, a great... Um, a great person at bringing the whole picture into play a lot of times. You do that well, and I appreciate you for that. So one clear statement, I ain't no sheriff of the city of Atlanta. We got a chief, we have a mayor. So that sheriff, what his thoughts are, he can, he can, he can share them with you. He can highlight them to you. He can put them on the news. Um, but we make the decisions around here. Full stop. He couldn't get to 700 like that. He's got to hire staff to be able to manage 700 people. So to get to 700, you have to hire, you have to manage. So it is a ramp up. And so the first phase, um, and, and um, Ms. Burst behind me can make sure I'm right, the 250 women that are down, well, it's actually 300 now. So, so you start moving, so you ramp up, and then the ramp down is according to how well we are going to require them to improve their full criminal justice process. There's a solicitor, there's a district attorney, and there are judges. People should be moving through these processes a lot faster so that we don't have individuals in the jail for years on years on years waiting trial. That in and of itself is why we have an overcrowding issue. It ain't our fault, but it is our problem. We can't shirk away from the problem just because it's not our fault. The more we keep thinking that they tell us what to do, that's not how that's solved. What we're putting inside of this is a conversation about in four years, they resolve that issue of the, the judges, which we need to talk about, and how many cases they can see in a year. Um, and that's a, that, 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 we, we're starting to force that hand. I just wanted to make that clear. And I ain't even want you to go that far into detail. See, I appreciate you for uh, drawing the full circle again. <laughs> I know, I went a little far, but everybody here us, needs to know. And you gave us, uh, you, you talked, your plan, what you just gave was part of what I wanted to hear about how we get out of there because yeah. uh, just ramping up cases as well. Uh, like, like, even though I said something about the sheriff, it's his job to find beds for folks that are sleeping on the floor. Right. I got friends sleeping on the floor. And so I, when I saw those crates and I saw folks sleeping in those crates and I was able to go to ACDC and I seen the difference. I mean, I just want to make sure that the sheriff understands your vision because I'm team you. Right. I just want to make sure that happens. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Any other council members? Uh, Mayor, thank you. I will just briefly speak on the nuisance ordinance. Um, so that was my legislation that I work with your administration, uh, Mr. Donald on, so I appreciate that. And similar to your point, my goal in that and my hope is I don't want this city to shut down anyone because I want them to work with us to better their problems that are contributing to crime. Um, just as an example, yesterday, I've reached out to you. I reached out to an owner uh, of a multifamily property um, because I was concerned about crime. They had a homicide and had multiple part one crimes on, in their community that's been open less than eight months. So we're working to set up a meeting with them to see how we can help and how they can help their situation. So the goal is to not shut down anyone uh, the city has already shut down six businesses without this ordinance. We will continue to work that path with the bad actors who do not want to work with us. So I uh, just wanted to uh, give that two cents in and thank you again uh, for coming to address the Public Safety Committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hillis. And, and um, I'll get out of y'all way. I did want to just say, one, we have the uh, Nightlife Advisory uh, Council. Um, a lot of those individuals are, you know, 
folks that you can reach out to and talk to. They are meeting on Thursday and, you know, would be happy to have your input on that. Um, they are going to help, you know, come up with ideas with you guys on timelines and number of dates, uh, you know, how many, you know, how many uh, it, within a certain period of time and then, you know, what's the uh, correction process, the curing process. Um, and so, you know, but also be reminded that you all, along with us, put $20 million in the hands of small businesses, plus $10 million for the resurgence grant, plus more and more money from this administration for small businesses um, over and over again. We're showing our commitment as a previous small business owner of a retail location. I understand uh, the challenges of being a small business owner, but also that through our support financially and Invest Atlanta and others, we have support for them. Um, but as far as nuisances are concerned, that's a problem for all of us if they don't get into right standing, um, no matter if they're small, medium, or large. Uh, we want to make sure that people operate with their permit, permission that is granted, that they operate uh, at the standard that every citizen deserves. Um, so thank you all. Take care. Thank you, Mayor Dickens.